Thank you everyone for being here this evening. We uh, are trying to uh, bridge uh, the humanities and the sciences. We are trying to bridge in this precise case um, mathematics and the arts. Uh, and our first uh, uh, speaker this evening is uh, Jean-Paul Van Bendegem, uh, which I am very, very happy to uh, have among us this evening. Uh, Jean-Paul Van Bendegem is a mathematician and a philosopher who's been teaching logic and philosophy of science uh, at the VUB for many years uh, and has um, had the opportunity over uh, the past years to collaborate quite often several times with artists uh, which um, you know makes it quite familiar with the topic that we are going to uh, talk about this evening and he uh, suggested to introduce his lecture as a random walk through mathematics, which I find very fascinating. Um, so I'll leave the floor um, to him right now. Thank you very much. I've suggested that uh, the title of the talk here on the slide, it is uh, the strange beauty of uh, mathematics, but it could also have been uh, a random walk through uh, mathematics. I really want to try to convince you uh, this evening that uh, mathematics itself is, well, pretty strange in a sense, but uh, of course I can assume that many among you already find mathematics very strange, but it is a, a strange kind of beauty. Uh, we will actually uh, do some proofs together now, the first thing I would, I, I would like to try to uh, uh, present to you is the idea that uh, we very often use, well, not very often, most of the time, uh, we use the expression mathematics, suggesting that there is such a kind of thing, whatever it is, that is labeled mathematics, and that everything that falls under that heading, mathematics, uh, has something in common. I mean, that, 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 that there's a common structure there. Now, the strange thing is that if you start to look at where is mathematics present? Well, the answer is, uh, uh, as I see it, that it is present almost everywhere, but in very different forms. And so I would like to take you first from simple everyday mathematics, really everyday mathematics uh, that you probably will, re uh, will, will uh, recognize, also to show that uh, mathematics is much more present in our everyday lives than we often assume. I will then say just a few words on the school mathematics, which is a very particular kind of mathematics, and then move on to the really weird stuff, namely professional mathematics. And that's strange stuff, to be uh, quite honest, but immensely beautiful. Uh, so if at the end, well, at the end, I hope uh, that you will understand uh, this famous cartoon by uh, Sidney Harris. Um, Probably in the back, it's perhaps not that easy to read the text. Uh, what you have here is, uh, well, there are two mathematicians at the blackboard. There are formulas uh, everywhere. And here in the middle of the blackboard, so this is supposed to be a proof that starts here somewhere and goes uh, down there. And then it says here, then a miracle occurs. And uh, one mathematician says to the other one, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Uh, mathematicians are extremely fond of this cartoon because it is an experience that they know that somebody presents a proof and you go through the proof, you try to understand the proof and then there's a step in the proof and you are wondering what the hell is happening here. And it appears like a miracle and it can take up to five minutes to two months before you realize, oh yes, of course. Uh, the trivial in mathematics is extremely complicated. Which is okay, yeah. So let's uh, start with uh, everyday mathematics. Okay, I've taken myself uh, as an example. Okay, the first thing you might say is not really uh, that much uh, of a mathematical nature. I could have chosen some kind of coded form. I mean, uh, uh, but okay. Uh, my place of birth, actually, this is correct. I mean, you can fill in uh, these coordinates and then you will find a very particular place really pinpointed uh, in uh, the city of Ghent uh, nearby, and you will see my actual uh, uh, birthplace. The other stuff, they're all numbers. I, I mean, uh, I can give a description of myself mainly in numbers. Uh, my age, 
my life expectancy. Now, okay, uh, my age, you can say that's uh, very something that's easy to uh, determine, okay? Whereas life expectancy, well, that's a statistical notion. Uh, it involves a probability. I have no idea wh whether I will be on the wrong end of the uh, Gauss curve uh, or not. Uh, length, weight, my, boss, my uh, body mass index, my bank account, distance home to work when I was still working. Now I'm retired, so I'm not supposed to be working anymore. So I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, 56 uh, kilometers. Now I have uh, inserted a small joke, of course, because uh, two jokes. Uh, if there are people among you, and I assume there are, who know how the body mass index is calculated, since you know my weight, you know my length, assuming that they are correct, well, my height, you can perhaps uh, guess a little bit. My weight is perhaps a bit more difficult, but you will have noticed that the uh, body mass index is completely wrong. That's impossible. And please do not copy my bank account because that's extremely silly since it is not my bank account. Uh, but you see, I'm just indicating here that although you have numbers here, this does not necessarily mean that they are by definition, because they are numbers, reliable. And we have been bombarded uh, with statistics and graphics uh, all through the uh, whole uh, coronavirus uh, period. We're not uh, at the end yet. So there too, uh, this one I like. I mean, sports, I mean, okay, I have in mind uh, what is going to happen tonight, of course, uh, although I'm not particularly interested, to be quite honest. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, since the exhibition is about uh, not only numbers, but mainly about patterns and structures, when I look at a football match, I just see 22 people running around. And somewhere a ball in the middle uh, going everywhere. And uh, luckily there's uh, this extra person who's dressed differently, so I know he must be something special. Uh, and that's about it. I don't see anything. I'm, I'm, I'm football blind. I can look at it, but I see nothing happening. Uh, well, it's uh, actually 11 plus 11, because uh, at least they are wearing different clothes, which is a nice thing. Although the guy in, in, in the gold, that's really confusing. Uh, okay, this, what you see here is a nice graphic representing the world record 100 meters uh, sprint. It's very nice because you see you start here in 1910, you move up to, uh, where are we here, 2010. So that's one century. In one century, it has gone down from 10.6 to almost 9.6, tenth of a second. Something very interesting about uh, the graphic, you see here the drop here, it's, it's really uh, outspoken, it really makes a dive downwards, and that has a very simple reason. That's uh, Usain Bolt, <laughs> okay, but it shows. We have these graphics in, in our newspapers uh, every day, and it is, of course, uh, mathematics. But if you go further, <laughs> I, I, I always uh, use this example because it's such a nice example uh, where mathematics is present in everyday life, yet it is uh, very often completely misunderstood. What, what, what you see here is a, a chart from, uh, taken from a newspaper. It says here, uh, rain. Uh, and it says here for Wednesday something, uh, there's a 30% chance of rain. Now, I have always... Uh, uh, test it with my students uh, when I give lectures to ask people what do you think does 30% mean in this context? This has been uh, studied uh, on, on a more scientific scale in the United States. <laughs> it turns out that people give two answers, the, really the majority of them. I mean uh, with uh, these two answers you cover more than 90% of all the people uh, questioned and the, the two answers are wrong. Uh, many people seem to think that 30% means that it will rain 30% of the time, which it doesn't. That's not the idea. But the other group, almost just as large, they really have a good sense of humor because they believe that it will rain on 30% of the surface. <laughs> so it's just a matter of not being in the 30%, but in the remaining 70%. Now, of course, you probably now want to know, but what does it mean then? Well, it's very simple. Uh, if you take 100 days, meteorologically speaking, similar to that day, in 30 of those days, it has uh, rained a certain minimum of rain. So 30% can really mean that you have one tiny shower of five minutes during the day. That's enough. 
So I always ask my students, if you see 30%, are you going to take your umbrella or not? And they don't know. Okay, just very briefly, I mean, uh, <laughs> when people tell me <laughs> that they, uh, they hate mathematics and so forth and so forth, uh, and, and then I ask them, do you play one of the uh, lottery games, the most famous one being the lotto uh, in this country, uh, they, they say yes, but then you are playing mathematics. Uh, I mean, when I try to explain to people that uh, if you do the calculations, I, 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 I will not go through uh, the, details, uh, the details here, uh, the calculation ends up with uh, 1 over 8,145,060. Those are your chances of getting the six numbers right. 1 over 8 million. If I can believe the uh, statistics, uh, and they are from a, a source that is uh, pretty reliable, in the United States, the chance of being hit by lightning is 1 over 500,000. So instead of playing the lotto, you should really uh, organize a lottery yourself uh, with as uh, main prize, I will be struck by lightning. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my, my, my other example is one over eight million. Uh, if I take Flanders, that's about six million uh, people living in Flanders. Now, if I would give you just a sheet of paper and it has a single name, uh, Jo van den Driessen, that's all it says. And, and, I, and I tell you, well, this person is living somewhere in Flanders. Find him. And the only thing you can do is you can wander through, through uh, Flanders, wherever you want. But then, at a particular moment, you have to choose a, a town, a street, a house. You ring the bell, somebody opens the door, and you ask, Jo van den Driessen? <laughs> and if he says, how do you know? You have more chance of winning that game than winning on the lotto. Okay. Now, I will not go into all the uh, mathematical rituals that go together with uh, this kind of uh, games, uh, lotteries. Uh, there's a, a large amount of superstition uh, involved. I will, I will not go uh, into that. I mean, in, I mean, as a mathematician, this can sometimes be really, uh, how to put it, uh, challenging. challenging. Uh, people look at uh, shops where you can play with uh, the lotto, and they see, okay, in that shop, uh, uh, an agent, a press agency, somebody has won uh, one million euros last week. Now, everybody goes there, because that's the place to be. <laughs> now, first of all, you can reason inversely. You can say, no, uh, what you have to look for is the place where up to, up to now, no one has won anything. That's the place to be. Uh, but in addition, what they sometimes do, this, this has been confirmed, what they sometimes do is they ask, okay, and when that person who won the one million euros, he uh, gave you uh, the form, where exactly was he standing? And they will take in exactly the same position and hand the formula. So that's a, a form of mathematical uh, ritualization of uh, everyday life. So it's really, it's really everywhere. Okay, let, let, let me move on. Uh, school mathematics. Um, I have to be honest, in secondary school, I was uh, pretty good in the mathematics. Uh, I simply enjoyed doing it. It was simply great fun uh, to do it. But sometimes I was really puzzled by the questions they asked. I mean, you got into the part of uh, algebra where you had... Uh, uh, two linear equations that have to be uh, solved, and that was an easy uh, algorithm to solve uh, that problem. And then you got concrete cases, uh, concrete cases, such as this one. On a parking lot are 100 vehicles, either bicycles or cars. The attendant counts the number of wheels, and that is 300. How many bicycles and cars are there? Okay, that's a very simple problem to solve. If uh, X is the number of cars and Y is the number of bicycles, well, there are 100 vehicles, so x plus y must be 100. Assuming that uh, a car has uh, four wheels and a bicycle two, four times x plus two times y, that's all the wheels you have, must be 300, and you can solve this quite easily, and you will find 50-50. These were very often supposed to be real-life problems. Now, I don't know about you, but I will not leave my bicycle with that uh, parking attendant. I mean, that, that person needs help. If he can move around his uh, parking lot 
counting wheels without looking whether he's counting car wheels or bicycle wheels. Uh, that's very strange to say the least. And if it is a real life example, if it would be here somewhere here in Brussels, but you know, it could also be in Ghent, then very likely you will have cars with no wheels. Uh, and if there happens to be a, a circus school nearby, you will have uh, bicycles with one wheel. Uh, so this is, I mean, if you look at these handbooks, and that's really uh, worth studying, uh, on the one hand, they seem to present real life examples, but at the, at the same time, they are not. Now, if you move further, you get into academic mathematics. And then you get uh, the strange stuff. I mean, okay, if I would tell you now, are all non-trivial complex zeros of the Riemann zeta function, you see the function here, uh, of the form uh, one half plus uh, i times x, where i is the imaginary unit. I would expect that you would say, sorry. And you are right, I mean, this is high level uh, mathematics. Nevertheless, at the same time, I want to, I want to inform you that uh, this uh, question, this uh, mathematical problem, is part of the uh, Millennium Prize problems. In 2000, uh, Gray uh, installed the prize for seven problems, consulting experts uh, in mathematics uh, all over the place, uh, for seven problems. And if you can uh, solve these problems, you get from the uh, uh, Clay Institute, you get one million dollars. Now, I, I want to warn you, please do not waste time on this. If you say, well, that's interesting, uh, I'll have a go this weekend, uh, one million dollars, that's interesting. Uh, and secondly, I mean, it, it's an anecdote, but it's such a telling anecdote. I mean, <laughs> I have to tell you this. Uh, of the seven problems, we are now 20 years into the 21st century. Uh, at this very moment, one of the seven problems has been solved, uh, namely the, uh, po the uh, Poincaré conjecture uh, by a Russian mathematician, Perelman. So the Clay Institute uh, informed him uh, well, okay, you have given the proof, fine, please come and collect your one million dollars. And he said, well, I'm living here in uh, St. Petersburg with uh, my mother and I'm feeling quite well here. Uh, really, one million dollars, nah, I'm not going to come to America for that, uh, thank you very much. Um, so if you want to give the impression of being a real mathematician, if you solve this problem, do not claim the money. Uh, Otherwise, people will, will think that you're only in it for the money. Uh, this academic kind of stuff, that's the, 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 that, that's the kind of stuff you get. I, I, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you get, and that's the kind of stuff uh, 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 where I needed a, a four-year training in mathematics to be able to make sense of this. Now, to be absolutely clear, uh, I've studied mathematics uh, early part of the 1970s, of the uh, previous century. Uh, if I see something like this, that's again high level mathematics, I don't understand this. So we are 25 years later, uh, mathematics has changed so deeply and so radically that there are now parts of mathematics wh where I would have been, well, uh, I have to be a student again to be able to make sense of this. Uh, so let alone for me to judge whether the proof that is given here is a correct proof uh, or not. I simply cannot judge it. Uh, I mean, to, uh, to try to explain to you what it is to be a mathematician, uh, I, ha I have had, as many others, the unbelievable uh, experience that a mathematical problem that has been open for 300, 367 years, 367 years between the time the proof was presented and the first formulation of the proof by uh, Pierre de Fermat, that's 367 years between these two. So you have to be patient, uh, that's clear. Uh, so it happens in my lifetime that they announced we have a proof for the last theorem of uh, Fermat. I say yes, I mean, if tomorrow uh, I would hear that uh, the Riemann zeta function problem has been solved, um, I'm, I, I am ready to die. I mean, that's uh, two of the seven problems solved, I mean, it would be uh, shameful if I would ask for more. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, afraid not. I mean, my ex life expectancy, I have still another 12 years to go. Nah, I haven't seen any real breakthroughs uh, at the moment. So the proof was published. 
And the journal where it was published uh, printed an additional 10,000 copies bec because they expected many people, I was one of them, to want to have an, a copy of that uh, journal. The proof is over 200 pages long, yes, of that level, 200 pages. We say, yes, and I started, and I read the first page, and that was okay, it was the introduction. I turned the page. I don't understand the first uh, formula I'm reading. So I know it has been proved, but in a sense, I do not know that it has been proved because I'm not able myself as a mathematician to check, has this indeed been, uh, been proved? Okay, so I have now been talking uh, already uh, a lot about uh, mathematical proof, and if you go to uh, academic or professional mathematics, that is really uh, what is at the heart of the uh, mathematical uh, activity. Uh, it's searching for proofs. What I have done here on this slide is simply to indicate how particular the mathematical proof is, which I think is a very important uh, uh, issue. If I start, uh, I mean, th th there's a whole story connected to this, but I'm now simply summarizing it in uh, consecutive stages. Uh, you s if you start with uh, rhetoric, then uh, you focus on the idea not so much what it is that someone is saying, but how it is said, how it is presented, uh, how the uh, emphasis uh, is given, uh, etc., etc. Uh, well, let me do very quickly, uh, because time is running, uh, very quickly, uh, one small example of uh, a, a beautiful example of uh, rhetoric uh, present in the uh, famous speech that we all know of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, I Have a Dream. Now, one way to organize uh, that speech would be to have uh, paragraphs that start with I have a dream that, and so forth and so forth and so forth, period, pause, and then start again with, I have a dream, and then second paragraph. That's not what Martin Luther King does. I mean, you can check it on uh, YouTube, it's there. What he does is the following. He has his first paragraph, I have a dream, that, 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 that. When he comes at the end of the paragraph, he immediately attach, uh, attaches to it, I have a dream. So I have a dream that one day, that, 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 all be equal, I have a dream. And then he pauses. And now you have the full attention of uh, the audience because they know that, 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 that there will be something coming. A special form of argumentation is logical argumentation. And in logical argument, argumentation, form becomes uh, important. And now you see already the first glimmer of uh, uh, the mathematical uh, creeping in. Namely, in logic, or in formal logic at least, what you try to do is the following. Normally, when somebody presents an argument, uh, uh, presents a, gives you a number of arguments to, to uh, plead for something, uh, you will, first of all, look at the content of what is being said. Uh, what is he talking, he or she is talking about? If you go to the logical form, and this is really a very old idea, I mean, you have to go back to Aristotle, uh, there you find it for the first time, where you say, look, it might perfectly well be possible that an argument is acceptable, or to use the more logical term, that we consider the argument valid. It makes actually a point, uh, not because of what is being said, but because of the form of the argument. So if I say I'm an elephant, and if I'm an elephant, I will uh, disappear to uh, the floor, then it follows that I will fall through the floor. If I accept these, these two statements, then I will fall to, to, uh, through the floor. Now, if somebody says, but you're not an elephant. I say, well, that's, that's not the point. If I'm an elephant, uh, uh, suppose I'm an elephant, suppose that if I'm an elephant, I, I will uh, disappear through the floor, then it follows that I will disappear through uh, the floor. And you can even go a step further. You say, look, look if anybody says something of the form, mm, 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 if mm, 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 then hmm, well, then it must be hmm. And now you can fill in what you want. I mean, this is a very powerful idea because if we can agree on, okay, this form is okay, then no matter how you fill in the form, you will have a correct argument. And mathematical argumentation is a very sophisticated form of that kind, of that form of, uh, of reasoning. To sketch uh, the, the difference, Suppose that I would uh, arrive home this evening and I would say, this was weird, 
I gave a lecture in the academy and there were some people smoking. That were really weird. Now it would be normal that my wife then asked me, wow, and what did the people who did not smoke think about that? And then if I would then reply, why are you asking that? Everyone was smoking. This is logically correct and mathematically correct. If I say that some people are smoking, I'm not excluding that everyone is smoking. But in our daily way of uh, talking to one another, if I say that some people are smoking, I'm implying that some people were not smoking. And there you have a very important element that shows that our everyday reasoning can really go into conflict with mathematical uh, reasoning. So, let's try a few things. Okay, I will skip this one, uh, because th th this will uh, set me off uh, on, a, on a quite different road. But I just wanted to show you that uh, logic and mathematics uh, for philosophers have always been very important. You can go back to the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century, where you get a first uh, logical proof for the existence of God by uh, Anselm of Canterbury. End of the 11th, beginning of the 12th century. I mean, great, this philosopher, the, uh, theologian, uh, Anselm, and he reasons as follows. Okay, let us define God as that being above which nothing greater can be taught. It's the greatest being. Okay. Now, there are two possibilities. Either that being only exists in my mind, or it exists in reality. Okay, let's take the first option. It exists only in my, my mind. In that case, I can think of another being which has all the properties of the greatest being, but with the additional property that it exists. Now, that being must be greater than uh, the greatest being, but that's a contradiction. So the first option drops out. God cannot only exist in my mind, hence the only the other option remains available, namely God exists in reality. The Ethica of Spinoza, the undertitle is uh, Ethica More Geometrico Demonstrata, proven uh, uh, you know, along the geometrical way, which in those days was more, more or less uh, coinciding with uh, mathematical. Uh, and, and, and this book tries to formulate an ethical theory uh, in the form of axioms, derivations, uh, etc. It was a failure, of course, uh, but the idea, to, to, to have the idea of uh, approaching what uh, ethics can be in that way. I'm not going into details because uh, when you look at uh, the passage uh, in uh, La Pensée, uh, <laughs> one usually forgets <laughs> the last paragraph. I mean, Pascal tries to explain that, that, uh, that, there's, a, that there's a gamble in, uh, involved. Usually it's called uh, Pascal's wager. Sounds more uh, impressive, but it's a gamble. Uh, and the argument seems convincing, but at the very end he himself says, wow, if anybody lets, uh, 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 is going to be convinced by this, that must be a really weird person. So he didn't believe it himself. Okay, fine. Uh, now, one might think that mathematicians themselves have a very clear idea of what a mathematical proof is. Now, what is interesting, and now it's the philosopher in, the, in me that comes to the foreground, that is not the case. What you see here is uh, what is called proofs by looking. Uh, the formula here on the bottom says if you have to add the first n natural numbers, so 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to a number n, that is equal to, to one half of n times n plus 1. This can be seen as a proof. Why? Because you have here one, the light gray uh, dots, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so it's a special, uh, special case. It's uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. The dark dots, are simply the same figure, but rotated. And added to the first figure, you get this rectangle. And this rectangle has uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on this side, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on that side. So it's 7 times 6. But you have counted it double, so you have to divide by 2. And so 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 is 1 half of 6 times 7. Mathematicians and philosophers have a lot of discussion whether this counts as a proof. Some say this is not a proof. It is something that evokes the proof. 
If you look for long enough uh, at the figure, the proof will somehow manifest uh, itself. It will show itself. Others say, no, 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 this is a valid proof. I mean, with ordinary proofs, with the formulas uh, and everything, you will go through, through the same process. Uh, and it can become very complicated. I'm not going to into, into the details here, but uh, this proof by looking uh, shows that if you take the third powers of the first n numbers, that is quite simply the first uh, n numbers added uh, and then squared. And for the more literary, uh, literary minded uh, among us, uh, this proof that I will present in a minute uh, has also been form formulated by a Dutch writer, uh, Multatuli, uh, whom uh, we know of his, uh, of his uh, first famous book, uh, Max Havelaar. Uh, but he also kept notes, ideas, uh, entitled. You have to prove that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I guess you're all familiar with that, which comes down, if this is the given triangle, I have to show that uh, the sum of the two red triangles equals the blue triangle. Because this is A, so this is the square on A, this is B, the square on B, and this is C, and the square on C. I add three triangles in red. This one, this one, and that one. I also add three triangles in blue. There, there, and there. Now, if you look at this figure, it's clear that the blue part is equal to the red part. Which means that since the red part is equal to the blue part, if I now remove again the red triangles and the blue triangles, since they're all equal, I'm removing equal parts, so I'm back at this figure. And so now I know, uh, since the blue was equal to the red, and what I have removed is the same, what is left must also be the same. So the sum of the two red uh, uh, squares must be the blue square. I mean, this is really so nice because what you have done is you start with this figure. You move to this figure. Here you observe something. And then you go back to uh, this figure. You add it. Now you remove it. And now you see that it is indeed equal. Before the proof, you had no idea. Really? Do, do the, red, uh, the sum of the red triangles equal the uh, triangles, squares, sorry, equal the blue square? Hmm. I give you uh, the... Uh, the other figure, I go back and say, oh yes, the same figure. And now you see, quote unquote, the proof. What I now would like to do uh, very briefly, because uh, um, I want to give you one example of the typical way of reasoning of mathematicians. Okay? Um, this is a very uh, peculiar thing. Uh, it goes as follows. If, if you have six people, six people uh, together, and you assume that either uh, two people know one another or they don't. So we assume that it is uh, yes or no. So it's not something in between. Uh, let's just assume, you can take any other relation, by the way, it need not be to know one another, but that's, uh, so imagine that uh, we, are, we will be out uh, uh, pretty soon uh, on the balcony, and then you wonder, okay, if, there are, if I look at six people uh, that either know one another or not, well, what I can, tell you for sure is that if you have six people together, six persons together, there will always be three persons there that either know all uh, that know each other or three people that do not know each other. That's inevitable. Now this sounds weird. I mean, okay, you say, well, I mean, just six people, six people arbitrarily chosen, then there have to be three that either know one another uh, all of them, or do not know uh, one another all of them. How is that possible? Well, here, here is the proof. Uh, what you have to do is the following. Assume that you are person one. So I have uh, five persons remaining, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. From the perspective of P1, what are the possibilities? Well, either uh, P1 knows everybody, or he knows four of the five and one not, or three of the five and two not, and then it switches. Either he knows now two of them and doesn't know three of them, or one of them and not four of them, or none of them. So either there will always be three persons that P1 knows, or three persons that P1 does not know. I take the first case. So the full lines indicate that P1 knows P2. So the full lines are P1 knows P2, P4. The dotted lines means that uh, he doesn't know P5 and he doesn't know P6. 
Now, let's see what happens if we want to avoid that there are three people that know one another or three people that do not know one another. Well, let's look at uh, P2 and P3. If we assume that uh, P2 and P3 know one another, then here I have my three people who know uh, one another, all of them. So that means that P2 is not supposed to know P3. Otherwise, uh, the, the problem is solved. We have three people that know one, one another mutually. The same goes with P3 and P4. If P3 and P4 happen to know one another, we have an, an, another triangle here. So you have to conclude that P3 cannot know P4. And of course, the same goes with P2 and P4, because then uh, P1 knows P2, P2 knows P4, P4 knows P1. And again, you have three people that know one another mutually. But now, of course, what you have here is P2 does not know P3, P3 does not know P4, and P2 does not know P4. Namely, here we have now three people that do not know uh, one another mutually. So you cannot avoid it. If you start the proof instead with the full lines with three dotted lines, you get exactly the same argument. So it has to be. Now, you might say, oh, well, that, that, that's a nice, funny example. Uh, actually, it takes me two steps to get into the most sophisticated mathematics uh, of the present moment, namely if you ask the inverse question. How many people do I have to bring together to be guaranteed that there are at least so many people that either know one another uh, mutually or do not know one another mutually? Now for six, uh, the answer is three. But if you go higher up, you say, okay, how many people do I have to bring together if, I, uh, uh, if there have to be 10 people that do, know, do not know one another mutually or do know one another mutually? At the present moment, we only have estimates. We do not have an exact answer. This is really high level uh, mathematics. But it gets weird and I'm uh, starting to round up uh, because I have to say something about infinity. I mean, it's, it's my favorite topic. Uh, <laughs> if there is a weird concept, then it is infinity. And when it gets into the hands of mathematics, it becomes, of mathematicians, it becomes even more beautiful and weird. Uh, just a historical remark, it's uh, quite amazing that uh, Galileo, in his uh, Discorsi e Dimostrazioni Matematici intorno a duo e nuove scienze, 1638, he makes a remark about uh, infinity. And he says, look, yeah, you can think about infinity, but really, it's such a weird concept, there's nothing you can do with it. And he gives this example. He says, okay, look at the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Now look at the squares, one, four, nine, 16, 25. On the one hand, it's clear that there are less squares than numbers, okay, because uh, three is not in this list and it, uh, is in, and it is in the top list, so there are less. But at the same time, you also realize that there are just as many. Because give me any number, I can tell you what the square of that number is. Give me any square, I, I can tell you of which number it is the square. So there are just as many. And so Galileo uh, concludes, you see, if you start to think about infinity, uh, you come to these weird conclusions, it's less and it's the same. I mean, so, okay, perhaps you can say infinity exists, but that's all. In the 19th century, this becomes a definition. When is a collection of elements, a set, if you like, infinite when it is possible to find a proper part that contains as many elements as the whole thing. So you see, this is really from the philosophical point of view, it's so beautiful. What starts as a contradiction with uh, Galileo, or at least something extremely implausible, so many years later, in uh, the 19th century, it becomes a definition. So really, it's really amazing. But it leads to a notion of infinity that is really strange. And so let me end here with uh, the famous uh, Hilbert Hotel. Maybe you, 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 you know this particular hotel, uh, but it, uh, it shows uh, how weird infinity is from the mathematician's perspective. So all that I'm going to say now is mathematically speaking correct. I mean, this has been uh, taught up by uh, George Gamow. Uh, trying to explain the weirdness of uh, infinity. Okay, here goes, uh, very uh, briefly and quickly. Imagine a hotel, and this hotel has an infinite number of rooms. Meaning that, give me any natural number, there will be a room with that number as its room number. Okay, there is a central reception in the hotel. 
may, uh, such that it is possible to send a message to everyone in the hotel present at the same time. Okay, that's a technical problem. That's not uh, uh, our uh, problem. Um, and the starting position is that the hotel is full. Now, full means here, give me any number. In the room with that number as room number, there is a person. So there are no empty rooms. Okay, I will just present you three scenarios. The uh, first scenario, imagine that one guest arrives and asks, okay, can you fit me up for, for the night? But you would expect that the answer has to be, sorry, we're full. But the uh, person at the reception desk uh, is a mathematician, and he says, oh, well, th th that's very easy. What he simply does, or she, is to send a message to all the people present in the hotel, could everybody please move one room? So one goes to two, two to three, and every person has a next room. Take any number, there is a next number. So everybody shifts one place, room one becomes available, and the hotel is full again. This will not amaze you if now 100 people arrive, no problem. If, if it is a finite number, you simply ask everybody to move the number of rooms equal to the number of guests. So then you say, will everybody move 100 rooms? And they can, everybody can do it, and it's full again. But it's even weirder than that. Imagine there's a bus arriving, and on the bus are an infinite number of people. An infinite number of people. Then you say, okay, no, no, look, uh, you cannot ask uh, everybody in the hotel present to move an infinite number of rooms. That's impossible. Quite, indeed, that's impossible. But you can do something different. What you can do is say, well, the receptionist sends a message to say, look, will everybody who's in the hotel now move to the room with the double number? So one goes to two, two to four, three to six, four to eight, etc. What has now happened? All the people present have now moved to rooms with even numbers, which means that all the rooms with odd numbers are now free. And that's an infinite number of them. Okay, if there would be a finite, a finite row of, uh, say, 100 buses, each one with a, an infinite number of people, you simply deal with them one by one. I have not uh, taken up this uh, scenario, it would, be, uh, it would take us uh, much too far. It's even possible that there are an infinite row of buses, each one with an uh, uh, infinite number of people in the, the bus. You can still accommodate them in the hotel. If you now ask the question, so you can put everybody in the hotel, there the answer is no. The hotel can be too small. Okay, if I would have had uh, plenty, plenty, plenty of time, uh, I would now have started off uh, discussing, because I have now mainly remained within mathematics, dabbled a bit with philosophy, but then I would really dive into the arts. I could explain you about uh, Xenakis and uh, Jan Xenakis and his use of statistics uh, to compose his works. I could uh, tell you a lot about uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, how mathematicians have found structures uh, in the works, so in, in the drip paintings of uh, Jackson Pollock, showing that he's making uh, paintings with a dimension between one and two. I would have explained that uh, all to you. I would also have talked about the uh, irregular tilings. It's an amazing uh, uh, subject. Uh, it's really, there's a lot to tell about this, but I can't do it. I would also like to tell you a lot about impossible objects, because they are there too. And mathematicians are very fond of impossible objects, because if an, if, if, uh, an object is impossible, you still have to show that it is impossible. Here you are looking at it, that's a different thing. I would have talked about sunflowers. Of course I would have talked about sunflowers. I mean, look at the spirals. This is a Photoshop image. Look at the two sets of spirals uh, in the picture. If you count the number of branches of the spirals, there are two consecutive numbers in the row of uh, Fibonacci numbers. I mean, I would have explained that uh, all to you, and then I would have been finally able to, to talk about myself namely how you can play a proof of Pythagoras' theorem on piano. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, please. Can you play the proof of Pythagoras on the piano? Ah, well, oh, there is a piano. Oh, well, I don't have the score with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's not an excuse. I mean, what I have done simply is, uh, one of the things that is in mathematics extremely important is translating one structure into another structure. 
and, and I think there are some very fine pieces in the exhibition that deal with that uh, yeah. problem of translating structures into other structures. Since mathematics can be really uh, uh, coded into, into detail, uh, it's a very exact code, you can translate that code into any other system that is also highly structured. So what I have done is I have uh, translated uh, a proof of Pythagoras' theorem into uh, gestures and uh, musical uh, well, notes on, on the piano. And so going through the steps of the proof are phrases uh, of the score. So I am playing uh, the proof. Yes, next question. Well, you have, you, you have the freedom. Because uh, the code is in, is in a certain sense uh, arbitrary. Yeah. So um, what I have done is uh, I, 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 I have tried to respect the uh, differences between, for instance, uh, specific numbers in the proof, if there is, there is a two or a four, to make those sounds uh, either uh, sharp or uh, diminished. Uh, and if there are variables, to make the distinction between the mathematical symbols, to uh, keep uh, that uh, distinction. Uh, so it's not entirely uh, musical notes, it's also gestures. Yeah. And there's also a dance version of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's the same thing, of course. Any other question? Yes. I need to repeat oh, the wow. question. Do you, yeah. do, you, do you feel any, perception, any, any, any change in the perception of mathematics in the last few years? <sighs> well, in a way, of course, uh, the whole episode we are now uh, living through uh, with the corona, uh, I, I'm, I'm really fascinating with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, news bulletin on the television where they, uh, there's always this uh, almost ritual moment where they, we, we, we will now present the figures. And uh, at least in a, in a number of contexts, I have noticed that ideas of uh, the downward movement is slowing down. That that starts to mean something. Uh, because... Uh, Hmm, that's a difficult one. Uh, what I, yes, no, what, what I do think is that uh, it's extremely important in uh, at least, well, certainly in secondary schools, but perhaps uh, more than that, uh, that mathematics is presented in a particular way. Uh, uh, and th that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, an exhibition such as uh, this one, Order of Operations, I is the kind of entrance you can uh, get to uh, mathematics uh, that can achieve more than a more, or, more or less a direct uh, entry. Uh, I'm always trying to explain to people uh, we have a perception of death. I mean, I can see that uh, you are closer to me than uh, you. Uh, that's my brain calculating. So if. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a bit of a joke, but it's, it, uh, I, I do mean it, actually. When people tell, to me, tell me, uh, oh, I'm so bad at mathematics, I really don't understand the first thing of it. I say, don't worry, your brain is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question? Okay, so yeah. basically the question is about the inspiration that sparked a particular uh, Eureka moment in uh, the mind of a mathematician or in the mind of an artist. Uh, yes, uh, I was actually in doubt uh, for the lecture uh, this evening whether I would go for the other lecture. Uh, I had two uh, options for myself. In the other lecture, I, I would uh, have stressed uh, the similarities. Uh, in my mind, there are more similarities than dissimilarities. Uh, the search for a proof is so 
similar to uh, what happens uh, in artistic research. I mean, well, take, if I can just take this one minute, just one yes. minute, uh, take uh, Jackson Pollock. I mean, when he was uh, doing some of his uh, experiments, uh, the canvas was on the floor. Uh, he was using a, a can of paint, uh, making a hole in the bottom, in the middle, and then going over uh, the canvas. And he look, looked at the result and said, nah, that, that's not really good. Uh, and then he experimented, and instead of having the uh, hole in the center, he moved it to uh, the border. And then, of course, you get two combined movements, namely the, the uh, movement of the, of the can itself and then the rotation of the can. And then he said, uh, wow, this looks good. What he has uh, done there is uh, he has discovered uh, the idea of uh, coupled uh, oscillation. So he was uh, performing chaos theory. Didn't know it, but it, it's a similar process. I mean. Uh, the famous mathematician, Dutch mathematician, Simon Steven, uh, who was one of the first uh, 16th, 17th century, uh, who said, we need uh, words in Dutch for the Greek words in uh, mathematics. And uh, mathematica in Greek, his proposal was wiskunst. So that's uh, not wiskunde, uh, uh, but wiskunst, uh, so the art of certainty. So he, he, he was uh, stressing the uh, artistic side of it. Yeah. A lot about creativity there. No? About the origin and, and the nature of creativity in itself. Whoa! No, I, I didn't mean to open the Pandora box. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do we no, have any other question? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to come back to the secondary school. Yeah. Um, you said with your example, which is absurd and not funny, um, you show that for many young people in South France, it's mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, sorry, we and yeah. small. What's the problem in our school? What's the problem in the class teachers and the way? Okay, so we have a question uh, really connected to the real world. Uh, so basically, yes, as you said, there is a problem uh, within uh, the education system in primary, and I would add also in secondary schools, uh, if, I am, if I may, uh, about the fact that uh, students disengage with mathematics because it's so abstract and disconnected from the real world, and how and where where is the problem? How uh, teachers can uh, move forward or solve this problem, in, yeah. in your opinion? In my ideal world, mathematics would be part of all the other courses. I mean, it's trivial for physics, of course, uh, that's, uh, but in literature, I mean, th there's a huge amount of uh, literature uh, where, you, where you can, well, where actually mathematics is present, Raymond Queneau. Uh, I mean, his uh, exercise de style, well, there has been a mathematician who has done the same thing for mathematical proof. So he has taken one proof and recounted the proof in 99 different ways, and they are really different. So, I mean, if you would be able to use that kind of material, uh, if you would try to explain, uh, well, for instance, with the six people, my story with the six people. Uh, for me, the greatest charm of uh, mathematics is that it can show you patterns, structures that are there, they are present, but you have to detect them somehow. So s sometimes I would think instead of, uh, well, instead of a course of logic, I would teach uh, Sherlock Holmes, which, by the way, I have done. Uh, it's a much better way to try to explain how uh, logic works. Uh, in the same sense, uh, per per perhaps, uh, I don't know, what, perhaps ju just an idea to present mathematics uh, as a kind of uh, detective work too. Uh, to see what is not yet seen. Uh, I mean, my story with uh, the uh, Pythagoras theorem, you add stuff, you subtract stuff, you put something on extra, you take it away again, and now you have shown something. 
I mean, that, that's, uh, there is wonder there. Uh, it's, if you focus too much on the algorithmic nature, it's fine. I mean, you have to calculate. Uh, of course we have to. But uh, it tends to take away the wonder. And that I would like to see uh, reintroduced. And, and, and I know plenty of teachers who try to do uh, that within the strict confines of uh, the program. They have to let it up, et cetera. We all know the story. Uh, so it is possible. Uh, I mean, I, I sometimes get asked to give lectures in secondary schools. And then I give them the full story of the Hilbert Hotel. I mean, they think I'm crazy. But that's only a psychological judgment. I mean, <laughs> there's not much you, you, can, you can do with that. Um, but you are fascinated, uh, some of them. But that's enough. If you have some of them, that's already uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.